sharp focus wider lens on the 2013-2014 academic year. We're really excited to have you here with us this evening. I am Dr. Cynthia Jackson Elmore, the Dean of the Honors College, and I will serve as our moderator tonight. And for those of you who may not have been with us for other forums, we want you to appreciate the purpose of these forums and what we're trying to achieve. We're very good at at universities inviting people in from the outside and celebrating people who are going to be here for a day, maybe a couple days, and they go away. And we thought that it would be important to celebrate our own homegrown scholars and experts and expose the community to the great work that happens here on campus. And the benefit is, after today, the discussions can continue. These are faculty and colleagues that you can associate with all throughout the year. You can potentially do research with, collaborate, take classes with, go out to lunch with, and so we want to be able to encourage that broad dialogue. We also choose large topics that can be addressed from a variety of disciplines and do just that. And so we don't expect to answer the big questions today. We expect to engage in those dialogue and then leave here energized and ready to continue the conversation and to see how different disciplines contribute to any one topic. So that's the purpose of Sharper Focus Wider Lens. I want to acknowledge my partner in crime hanging out in the back of the room, Professor John Beck, who facilitates this series for us. And later on this evening, he'll facilitate the question and answering. And also, he comes up with a couple of good zingers for the panel, so I'll warn you now that he has some really good questions that he usually winds up throwing in the mix. And then we also have Steph B.C. Pack with us tonight from the Honors College, who will be recording the event and what we try to do is make sure that the forum is available not just tonight, but for future use. And so tonight we're going to talk about looking at sports. And our panelists are going to present you with a variety of perspectives. Uh, I'll warn you in case you see paper sliding, we actually are going to try to stick to time. Because a big part of this is that we want to have a dialogue with you. And so after each panelist presents, we'll have a little bit of give and take on the panel, and then we'll open it up to the floor for discussion. And so we're going to begin this evening with Dr. Peter Alegi is a professor in the Department of History and he teaches both graduate and undergraduate courses on Africa, South Africa, and global football and sports. He's the author of African Soccer Spaces, How a Continent Changed the World's Game, and Larima, Soccer, Politics, and Society in South Africa as well as many journal articles and chapters in scholarly collections. He has co-edited two collections with Chris Goldsman, South Africa and the Global Game, and Africa's World Cup, Critical Reflections on Play, Patriotism, Spectatorship, and Space. Dr. Neji is also Director of Digital History Projects with the History Department at Matrix. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. We have a few minutes, so I'll be on the way to the point here. Uh, Karl Marx opined that uh, religion is the opium of the people, but in our modern world, you would maybe say that sport is the opium of the people. I was just reading this morning in the New York Times that at the Jacksonville Jaguars NFL Stadium, there are a thousand people a week that go to get access to a lounge where there are multiple. Protesting. 
They were protesting the arrangement that the Brazilian government signed with FIFA, soccer's world governing body, which essentially stated that uh, the Brazilian taxpayer was going to bankroll this global sports festival, the World Cup. Uh, but most of the profits were going to accrue to this Swiss-based uh, sports organization. And the protest actually started with a protest against higher bus fares. And they escalated into a massive uprising that called into question the misguided nature of spending on large, gargantuan, high modernist stadiums while hospitals and schools are crumbling in Brazil. This didn't happen four years ago in South Africa, when South Africa, another power of the Global South, hosted quite successfully the Soccer World Cup. There's Mandela, the day that South Africa was given the rights to host the tournament by FIFA, and he was one of two Nobel Peace Prize laureates uh, in the audience. Next to him, you see Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And here's Mandela, a man who spent 27 and a half years in prison, uh, fighting for freedom, equality, and justice in South Africa, and he's weeping. He's weeping because his country won the right to host a sporting event. So, you know, is it the opium of the people? It's, it's a tough question to answer. Uh, I've written several books, most recently uh, the edited collection that Cynthia kindly mentioned, that tries to reflect a little bit more deeply on this topic. And part of what the book argues in the introduction, and also in terms of what the contributors uh, share, is this kind of paradox in South Africa, that South Africa was tremendously successful in hosting the tournament. It displayed an efficient organization. It built excellent stadiums, uh, five of them brand new. It had the third highest World Cup attendance in history after the United States and Germany. Top-notch security, which was a great concern for a country with a high rate of violent crime. Fairly good accommodation. And also it displayed functional transportation systems and telecommunications. So those are all big successes, which point to the positive impacts that the tournament had on South Africa. First of all, this kind of brand South Africa uh, the image of the country as a technologically advanced, democratic, modern, business-friendly, uh, attractive tourist destination was marketed worldwide. The tournament also challenged, I think, uh, although I didn't think it erased it, but it challenged negative images of the continent and also of African people who were often portrayed in particularly Western media as essentially uh, passive victims of terrible tragedies of corruption, of disease, death, uh, wars, etc. I was in South Africa for the entire year in 2010 teaching as a Fulbright scholar at the University of Postal Natal, and I was fairly surprised actually at the level of unity that the tournament engendered among uh, a diversity of South Africans. It generated a sense of we-ness that really you don't see very often in a country that is still riveted by uh, deep divisions along racial uh, class and other lines. It was also very nice to see the amount of pride that South Africans really expressed. Unfortunately, though, it was temporary. It, uh, it dissipated quite quickly after the tournament. Similarly, in the realm of the emotions that, that the World Cup brought about, it was encouraging to see a rebirth of a sense of Pan-Africanism, that, that particularly black South Africans uh, experienced a rebirth in solidarity with other uh, African people from uh, north of the Nipopo River. This is particularly significant because, unfortunately, there's been a uh, very serious tension in South Africa regarding the immigration of other uh, people from other African nations and rampant xenophobia. Uh, so the fact that soccer brought people together temporarily to see themselves as Africans first and foremost I thought was, was quite a positive impact. Of course the country gained a tremendous <coughs> mega event management experience. Uh, it's a very complicated event, 32 participating nations. Uh, you've got to cater for thousands and thousands of uh, media members and um, South Africans now are fairly confident that they can host the Olympics, and I think that experience with the World Cup was, was very important. Uh, in the host cities, you saw revamped urban infrastructure, ranging from public transportation to media centers to uh, malls, uh, which I consider a kind of new plague on the African continent, but uh, interestingly, most of my friends love it. Uh, and uh, also these fantastic stadiums uh, that really conveyed a televisual image that was almost priceless. Uh, and finally, the South African Soccer League uh, found its reputation enhanced, so much so that there are European players uh, going to South Africa now to play.
play professional soccer, inverting that kind of dynamic that we often see, which is poor athletes from the global south, whether the Dominican Republic with baseball or certainly the African continent with soccer, right, which you tend to siphon off the talent. Now South Africa is becoming a target of integration, and the World Cup has something to do with that. There are also negative effects that the World Cup had, and I don't have much time, so I'm just going to point to uh, certain ones. First of all, these brand new stadiums and the refurbished ones have basically become white elephants. With the exception of one of the ten stadiums used, they are not used regularly by the South African clubs. They're simply too expensive to rent. The flawed economics of the tournament, I think you're seeing them in Brazil, and they were a spark to the protest, as I indicated before, uh, are apparent to everybody. So much so that the head of the local organizing committee recently apologized to the media for spending so much of the taxpayers' uh, money for essentially private aid, seven billion dollars roughly, public funds. Now FIFA walked away with over three billion dollars of tax-free revenue, while the local organizing committee made perhaps a hundred million dollars. So the inequity of that arrangement quite troubling. And the tournament itself uh, earned less than half a point, or Gina added, excuse me, less than half a point, uh, a percentage point in GDP. If you went to any of the games, the first thing that struck you was, where are the African spectators? This tournament could have been taking place in Australia or Qatar, as it will in 2022. Only 36,000 tickets were sold to uh, Africans from outside South Africa. So it really was kind of a FIFA event that happened to be staged. South Africa. Before the tournament even started, the South African government passed two acts of legislation that allowed FIFA to create essentially extraterritorial uh, zones around the stadiums where the South African Constitution did not apply. These are called the Special Measures Act of 2006. A colleague of mine was arrested, in fact, in one of the uh, fan parks, not even the stadium, but a fan park, uh, for handing out anti-xenophobia flyers. And when he protested to the police captain that a South African and he had a constitutional right to free speech, the captain literally laughed in his face as he handcuffed him and said, not in this FIFA zone, you know. And I think that sets a really dangerous precedent because it means that when these global events arrive in cities and nations around the world, there are grounds to suspend sovereignty, national sovereignty, and even constitutional rights. And finally, and most importantly, I think, in, in, in many respects, in terms of how this event touched the everyday lives of South Africans, grassroots comfort development was overlooked. Right? And so I'll end with two quotes. One from Ferio Hafeji, one of the, the prominent black journalists in South Africa, former uh, activist. She said, I think rationally and fiscally the World Cup was absolutely not worth it. But emotionally I wouldn't have missed it for the world. For the intangible benefits for our country and the Philippines given it at a difficult moment. I was really worried about 20 years of democracy in South Africa. I'm not so worried anymore. I always thought that nationhood and non-racialism we're evaporating dreams, and in fact, I see they can still be made tangible and real. And my good friend Tabo Tata, the founder of a youth football academy called Izikwe, after Shaga's original regiment, it's Rumat, he says this, grassroots development would have been the biggest legacy of the World Cup, but we didn't do that. Because we only look at sports at the elite level, like the World Cup. We don't look at sports at the grassroots level, but that's where life is. People live at grassroots level, not elite level. So the World Cup was successful, but too many young people in this country still have no hope. They have no future. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. What a, what a note to end on. So I want you to keep those quotes in mind as we go forward and we come back to further conversations. And next we're going to have Dr. John McClendon, who is a professor in, excuse me, in the Department of Philosophy and former director of African American and African Studies here at Michigan State University. His areas of focus include African philosophy, philosophy of African American studies, Marxist philosophy, and the history of African American philosophers. Dr. McClendon co-wrote Beyond the White Shadow. He is also author of C.L.R. James Notes on Dialectics, Left Hegelian or Marxism-Leninism, and several monographs, reports, booklets, and articles in noted anthologies. Thank you. Good evening. This is a historic occasion. Is your mic on now? This is a historic occasion. 110 years ago, Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois published historic work, The Souls of Black Folk. How many know that piece? So we have a feeling of this piece. It was historic because when Dr. Du Bois spoke to 
respect to African Americans in sports is that there's been very little written by philosophers. And so as we undertook this project, Beyond the White Shadow, it was clear to us that historians, as my colleague here, sociologists, and others have written quite a bit about African American in sports, but philosophers were virtually silent. And we thought that perhaps if we did something at the level of a rudimentary text that would introduce some of the problems in actually defining what is the philosophy of sports, <coughs> excuse me, that the context of the African American experience would serve as not only the point in which we have as our object of investigation, but also as the context in which we begin to think about the content of the categories to shape the very notion of philosophy of sports. Now, when Du Bois made that statement 110 years ago, most people understood the color line singularly as a matter of black exclusion and segregation what became known as Jim and Jane Crow. But the boys had a deeper understanding of the notion of the color line. In terms of the worldwide impact of imperialism on people of African descent, he in fact attended in the year 1900 the first Pan-African Conference held in London, organized by Henry Sylvester and so he was very keen on trying to find a way in which he could capture the implications of imperialism for all people of African descent. Hence, Jim Crow, Jay Crow, or what is properly known as segregation, was only one aspect of worldwide imperialism and the color line. Now, what we began to see was that the boys began to argue for a notion identity, but not simply as a metaphysical formulation wherein the idea of blackness was seen in abstraction from the concrete context of the color line and the African American experience. In fact, black identity was directly tied to what became known as white identity. And so immediately we began to see that the Plessy decision of 1896, in which the Supreme Court ruled the separate but equal doctrine would be upholding the Constitution, what Du Bois understood was that the color line was a matter not only of black exclusion, but black oppression. And hence, many people who began to talk in terms of the Negro problem failed to understand that the problem was not with black people, but the problem was with racism and white supremacy. And hence, the problems that black people have had were the result of their conditions of oppression and exploitation. Now, as we examined this notion of the color line, what we found was that immediately following the Plessy decision, there were some very significant changes in the very nature of sports. And we came to understand that a number of scholars, especially philosophers of sport, had failed to take into account the fact that this development with respect to sports and its relationship to society at large was not merely symbolic, and thus we argue that sports in its relationship to the broader social, political, and economic context is not a matter of merely symbolism, but is in fact a mirror of the broader society, part and parcel of the social, political, and economic relations. Hence, what the boys brought to our attention was a way in which we could understand why it was that the dominant sport in which African Americans were a part of at the turn of the century, namely horse racing, black jockeys dominated horse racing as African Americans dominate the NBA today. Can you imagine that? That the leaders in the first Kentucky Derby, that 15 of the people who completed the Kentucky Derby were African Americans. By 1903, they were forced out of horse racing. Hence, when Du Bois
legacy that says that black approval is at the core of black progress. We in turn argue it's not a matter of white affirmation. White approval is more a question of African American affirmation through a process of struggle for liberation. Thank you. It's okay, Clap. <laughs> Nature helps us respond 
lot of the benefits focus on the socialization side. There's also a physical benefit to activity, to sports, to games, to these kinds of things. So people tend to participate for some beneficial reason, whatever that might be. And then the neat part of it, about it, the most difficult part to study, really comes down to what's your value system for your risk. Like, how many of you would even consider Russian roulette? I would hope none of you. But yet, those individuals, you have to ask yourself, who actually do that for whatever reason, in that moment, the benefit of that particular activity to that person exceeds its cost, although the cost is ultimate. For that moment. And so when you get into more activities, I want to be a part of the socialization of my high school. So I want to play a sport or I want to be involved in an activity. And you tend to evaluate, OK, am I going to get involved in, in a collision activity? Am I going to be a track athlete? Am I going to play uh, ping pong? What's going to be my activity based on my level of value judgment as to what risk is acceptable? Because remember, in, we are all in, in, a, in a mode these days only look around to see the activity levels on campus of health. We're all pursuing better health. We want to cut out smoking. We want to cut out um, obesity. We want to cut down on, on cardiovascular disease. We want to cut down on all of these things. And we want to improve our health. We want to have better nutrition. So we cut out certain parts of our nutrition and make it unhealthy for us. So why do we do that? Because our benefit exceeds the risk. And, but in the concept of musculoskeletal and physical health, you have to risk the very health that you're attaining in order to attain physical health. In other words, you must place your body at risk in a physical activity environment in order to actually improve the health. I.e., if you wanted to, if you decided that the benefit was in running, choose that as an example, and I'm going to go out and run 15 miles every couple three days, and I run. Lansing, is there any risk to that? Well, if you go to the right part of town at the wrong time of the day, you know, or, and one of my favorite things is trying to cross across the Red Cedar by Smarty during class changing. When you have bicycles, skateboards, roller veins, automobiles, and disinterested people all crashing through the same thing without any apparent. I figure if I'm going to buy something, it's going to be there on campus because everybody's doing something. So you, you assess that risk. And so if I'm going to run, and I'm going to run through that, I increase my risk. Um, there have been traditionally people who are, are distance runners, marathon runners who run constantly. And a few years back, Jim Fix was killed because he was hit by a car running. So you all, there's always the element of risk in whatever physical activity we do. And so you actually, and we actually look at the health improvement, but you have to risk your health to get there. It's not free. So all of this is part of the way we are located. And so now, when you look at the community of sports, you ask, why is it that people put up with or take on the injury problem in an activity when you know it has potential for getting there, football, basketball, baseball, whatever sport you pick, soccer, there's an element of risk. There's an element of injury. People get hurt. The only way not to get hurt playing soccer is don't play soccer. It's the only way to do it. Okay? And so if you choose to play, then you have made a value judgment based on the risk cost benefit ratio. The, cost, the benefit to me for me to play is better. And that benefit can sometimes be extremely powerful. In professional ranks, the primary benefit is financial. In college ranks, you can argue it's financial or it's the thought of getting into a financial community. Or in many of the sports at the college level, it's still the game, the fun, the participation, the camaraderie. In the younger kids, we're trying to help them learn about physical activity. So those kinds of things really are part of what we do. And as an athletic trainer, my job is to try to provide a healthy environment for our kids to participate. But in order for me to understand that, I need to understand the risks that are associated with so risk plays a big part in the selection of sports as an individual, but it also then becomes a major factor in the organization of sports and the organizers of sporting activities. How do you address the inherent risk of the sport, which is one thing, 
How do we cover those who are participating? And we do that with medical staff and conditioning and coaching and skills and development and strength and all of those kinds of physical components. But for an organization like Michigan State, we also have the other aspect of that sport and its risk of capabilities, and that is how do we protect the 76,000 people in Spartan Stadium on Saturday afternoon from injury? So risk is a part of everything that we do in sports, and it's the practical side of what makes it successful. So as you think about sport, and as we talk about it, think about the concept of why me or why the other. Thank you. Thank you, John. And our next panelist is Dr. Deborah Feltz, and she is a university distinguished professor in the Department of Kinesiology. She is a sports and exercise psychologist and specializes in self-efficacy and the psychosocial implications of sport and physical activity participation. She is interested in the interrelationships of self-efficacy, motivation, and performance among youth, teens, and coaches. Dr. Feltz also focuses on motivation within groups and exercise. She and other MSU researchers are currently working with NASA to create astronaut exercise regimens to be used in space. Deb? I'm not sure if, is this, is this on? Before I, I start dealing with some of the, the work that I've been doing, I, I wanted to, uh, to, to step back and, and talk a, a little bit first about the field of kinesiology that most of us, uh, or half the panel, uh, comes from uh, here. Uh, so that you have an idea of just what that field uh, is. Uh, kinesiology can be thought of as the study of movement and physical activity, human movement, or at least the applications of the human movement, and physical activity from the uh, cellular level to the society level or society's world level. At some universities, all of us would be in the same department. So we all, would all be looking at physical activity or sport from one of those perspectives. Uh, there are individuals who look at the, the genetics of physical activity. Why is it that some people adapt to training much more quickly than, than others do. Uh, similar to uh, uh, weight loss. You know, some are able to move faster than, than others are. Uh, so what, what is that genetic component and how does it interact with some psychological uh, components and uh, some of the um, uh, cultural uh, kinds of components. So, so we look at that broad lens. Uh, so, it, so it is a cross-disciplinary -dis field. My area is in the behavioral aspects of that field. And some of that relates to some of the things that, that John has been talking about as well, perceptions. In the, the behavioral uh, side of the field, we generally look at, uh, at research questions uh, from uh, one, of, one of two uh, perspectives. One is what are the, the psychological factors that influence physical activity or sport participation? Uh, and, and how might they uh, influence uh, that participation? So for instance, uh, you know, how does self-efficacy, which uh, uh, I often just term self-confidence, how does that influence one's performance? Uh, is it uh, more confidence the better? Uh, or might there be some detrimental effects by being overconfident? Uh, how does emotional arousal or anxiety influence performance? What about choking? Uh, individuals who are accomplished performers and all of a sudden they, uh, they choke. What were the psychological factors leading up to that? Then as well, we can look at it from the, the other side of the equation and, and what kinds of psychological uh, variables are influenced by and result from our participation in sport uh, and physical activity. Uh, does our participation in sport 
Lord uh, help us build leadership qualities that might transfer to the business world? Uh, does participation in sport uh, lead us to be more aggressive individuals? Or can we just leave that on the field? Is, it, is that what we call contextualized? So those are the, some of the examples of the kinds of things that we look at from this behavioral side. Motivation is uh, one of uh, the things that I am uh, particularly interested in. And I've been interested in that uh, from uh, the side of uh, sport, uh, from uh, individual uh, sport participants, team uh, sport participants, and uh, as well as coaches. Uh, and even referees are, are a part of the, the world of uh, sport. But lately, I uh, have been uh, focusing on a, a project that sort of fell into my hands. Uh, and, and that is, what can be helpful to astronauts uh, to help them participate more intensely in the exercise that they need to do when they are in a microgravity environment? And why is that important? That's important because in that environment, if they don't exercise, they lose bone density. In fact, they can lose as much bone density in one month as a post-menopausal woman who is not on medication loses in one year. That's, that's how fast they can lose bone density. And they also lose muscle mass. Um, the kinds of things that just help them keep an upright posture once they um, come back to Earth and cardiovascular function. So these are all things that can be very detrimental and, and they know this, just like we know that exercise is good for us, right? As we sit on the couch and watch a football game, uh, or football games all afternoon. So we, we know it, but you know, we, we don't necessarily engage in it like we are supposed to and at the intensity levels that, that we should to get the health benefit uh, that is good for us. And this becomes especially problematic when individuals are out uh, quite a ways from Earth, uh, not with family anymore, and it's been a long time, and boredom sets in, uh, depression might even set in. And so we have uh, come up with uh, devising a, a, a way uh, through a virtual partner, a virtual partners for uh, these astronauts to be able to exercise with. And we have used uh, uh, principles of motivation and group dynamics to try to look at this. We have, we have not actually done the testing yet. We're in the design phase. Uh, but are working with people from telecommunications uh, and uh, uh, video game design to help us uh, do that. And I will stop there. Uh, we'll continue with questions. I, that's okay.
what does that say for society as a whole? And what does it say when we have a whole segment of society or an institution within society that is a, a microcosm of society as a whole and we say it's special and it's different? And somehow it's exclusionary to that experience and we don't even think about the implications in any, any one aspect of society to another. And, and sports is the great equalizer and at the same time, we see things happening in sports that suggest we, we haven't come as far as we think we have and, and how do we rectify that. And then we have the individual and organizational side. How do we make decisions even in the face of knowledge of the right things to do and the benefits? And how do we break away those risks and benefits and make good decisions? Even amongst those who study and know what to do, we know that we don't always make the best decisions. So how do we educate the society at large about the things to do for health improvement and the importance of engaging in physical activity? And then how do we help young athletes make decisions about how they engage? Just, just a couple of themes that came across. And so first I'm going to ask the panelists, as you were listening to each other, you're, you're from somewhat disparate areas, but you're, you're juggling the same issues in a way. If there were things that came up in other panelists' talks that you wanted to ask each other about, we want to allow you to get to We always play kind, so <laughs> there's no questions. We're going to open it up to the audience, and John is going to come grab a mic, and at any point in time, we'll also give the panelists an opportunity to be back on each other's comments. <laughs> Hey, how about that? Let me uh, let me start with one, and then open it up to everybody else. I feel that there might be a tension that some of you are raising about the fact that all of my children were involved in far more sports than I was as a child. I mean, they were playing soccer, they were playing this, they were playing that, they were playing the other thing. So you could say that this is a golden age of sport in terms of participation. And perhaps, uh, as you put it, a great equalizer, a great leveler, or maybe that this is a new democratic spirit as this board is so large. Would, would any of the four of you please comment? Are we at a golden age in a way? And what does it say about democracy? I mean, you know, is it, is it a democratic spirit that we find in sport? Does it make our society better? John, I'll challenge you. I think you were really raising a number of things. Um, are we better off because of the level of support that we have? Any four, any one of the four of you, all of you, please do comment. Well, one of the things that, another way of looking at this is that there was a time when there wasn't a lot of organized, organized youth sport, and it was more spontaneous. Now there's so much of it that uh, it really is a business. And, and, and you know, and yourself, and I know that I, I know, uh, having put a, a child through sports, uh, how, how much came out of my pocketbook. Uh, and there's more and more and more and more. So, there's, so another way of looking at this is that it's not, Maybe it's the golden age for those in the sports, youth sports business that they're really finding a market for this. And taking the control away from the kids. Well, I, I would argue that you have to understand that in a very kind concrete way. That's why we begin to look uh, at the point of slavery. And if we look at sports and slaves, it was always a business. Slaves were a commodity. Uh, Slaveholders would bet on slaves. And there was gambling around horse racing. There was gambling around boxing. Uh, we even talked about Sylvia Du Bois, who was a black woman, the only woman uh, recorded to be a boxer who fought against men. Now, the reason why she fought against men was because the very notion of the cult of femininity didn't apply to black women. Slaves. At the same time, black men were not allowed to fight white men. So you had this very curious thing because if black men were fighting. 
how do you define sports? And some people define it as with, with respect to leisure time and play. And we don't, how can you talk about leisure time and be a slave? Frederick Douglass made very critical comments about sports as slaves. So we introduced a new concept called release time. Not leisure time. Leisure time presupposes that you have leased the free labor and so therefore have a de facto predatory right. Now, when we look at the development of sport from the standpoint of race, class, and gender, we got to understand that even the most amateur sports, the Olympics, have always been very political and always involved a lot of money. Uh, we looked at something called the country sports, like tennis, for the genteel. It always involved a kind of elitism, but it always involved a certain kind of money, initially for men and not for women. Men played tennis for money, women didn't play, or women were paid. But then if we look at the history of that, and we understand it today, we understand that money plays a big part in what sports people are participating in. So one of the things we look at is volleyball. Now volleyball has a very low number of African American women participating in contrast to basketball. So the question is why? I mean, both sports are very similar. You have to jump, you have to have a good vertical leap, you have to have good eye-hand coordination. So why is it that you find fewer black women playing volleyball than you do basketball? And it boils down to the business side of sports because to, to join a club and club play is the way in which you make it to collegiate sports. You have to pay hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to join a volleyball club. So as a result, then more African American women participate in basketball. You can go to the park and play basketball, but you can't go to the park and play volleyball and have an opportunity to go beyond you know, the high school level. So what you see now is that with respect to a sport like volleyball, it's predominantly white young women who play the sport, with a few exceptional African American women who stars, unfortunately. cover and uh, I just saw the day that my daughter at Penn State they're ranked number one in the country. She's a three time All American. So but there was a, a, a an advantage that they had, their parents could afford to send them to a club. So it had nothing to do with talent, it had nothing to do with merit, it had nothing to do with it being an amateur sport, because ultimately if we don't understand sports as the mirror of the society in which we live then we won't understand why today that you only have one African-American jockey who is actively participating in the sport. And despite the efforts of Charlie Sifford and many other African-American golfers beyond this guy Tiger Woods, how many do we see of that sport? And even today, despite the glorification of the Jackie Robinson story, we have fewer African-Americans playing baseball than what we did just 15 years ago. So we have to begin to understand then the political economic realities, you were talking about that with regard to South Africa and soccer, that those are the realities that shape this thing called sports. Okay, so if someone would raise their hand, I'll hand you the microphone. Comments or questions for our panel on both? This is my exercise program, it's running on the room in the room. And Deb, you tell my wife I exercise tonight, okay? My name is Ike. In the absence of anyone breathing, I'm uh, just trying to ask the first question. Um, Dr. McLeary talked about the views of uh, Dr. Du Bois. That reminded me of uh, the program I just watched yesterday on PBS, and that was by um, Bill Moyes, interviewing the author of A Game Over Against Frank Sofman, if I read that book. During the discussion, they said a lot about sports, different aspects of sports. Some of the discussion, actually, some of the details were somewhat riveting. To me, because of because it, it involves some kind of ways and some kind of placing of emphasis where we wonder where 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 are we 
what, what happened to the last ones? And I give some examples. Um, they said something about uh, the boys lamenting about the uh, oversized budget of sports, a lot of money sports, and college sports, in comparison to academics. Five point seven was it was seven to one, and this was way back away. You complain about that now, but about over hundred years ago that it started. Uh, they said also something about what we talk about as a student athletes. And there's nothing like student athletes, it is athlete students. But first of all, an athlete before you are a student. That's what I think. Okay, they talk also about the fact that students are in four years college to start and play sports. But in actuality, it is a one year renewable scholarship. Correct me if I'm These points are just coming to me as I was making my notes when you guys are talking. And it is based on performance. So if you broke your leg or whatever, if you weren't performing, that's the end of it. They talked about um, traditional rates among athletes. These are some, actually, my comments are being directed to Dr. McLean and somewhat to Dr. Alain. Um, traditional rates of athletes particularly black athletes. What could be done about it? Because in spite of the fact that there is enormous financial flow that these athletes bring to the college that they play. Um, there is also this touchy question about whether or not student athletes should be paid. Bearing in mind the billions of dollars that they um, I don't know if that's a no-go area, but you can help us understand that better. Um, they talked about the negative effect of money in sports, and this is where I come to Dr. Alec. Be it in South Africa or here, um, they, they discussed the point of that one week after Detroit declared bankruptcy. Governor Snyder was back in Detroit to commission over $400 million arena for the record to be bought by taxpayers. So all this, that's why I decided that's relative to me. I mean, when I think about all that they talk about, several other things to drug exports and all that, all that. but we just, I would like you to you to address some of this as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent comments. I think uh, I've had that interview, uh, the more is the digs iron on my yes. iPad loaded for a while. I still haven't been able to watch it. So this is inspiring me to finally this evening go and watch the whole thing. Uh, really, it's a lot of interesting points. I don't think I can do justice to uh, all of them. But uh, there's a fabulous uh, article that appeared last year in The Atlantic magazine uh, by Taylor Branch, who's a well-known historian, entitled The Shame of College Sports. And he's a guy who played Division I football, if I'm not mistaken. He's not a, a sports hater by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, it's freely available online. And if anyone has time and is inclined, read it, because it gives you a wonderful in-depth well-documented history of how we got to this point where you know, uh, we are in a situation where a city like Detroit goes bankrupt and our public officials are, are only concerned with building arenas for private profit with taxpayer funds. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's astounding. Uh, my personal position is that the, the athletes, uh, first of all, student athlete is a complete myth. I mean, it's a fiction. Uh, Taylor Branch makes this point very, very clearly that article. Uh, it's in fact a, a cardinal point in this scam that the, essentially the NCAA is running. Uh, and, and they're pretty clear in this department, frankly. Uh, I think they should be treated like TAs. Uh, I think they should earn a 
salary. Uh, and furthermore, I would suggest that while they're playing full time, talking about college football and basketball in particular, I'm not necessarily uh, talking about the other sports uh, because I think the situation is a little bit different in other sports, but uh, they should have four years of eligibility to use their scholarship money. So if, if when they're playing, you're just taking a course or two, I'd be fine with that because uh, they're essentially like professional athletes at schools like MSU. And then they can focus on their, on their academics once their pro careers. Their hopes and aspirations and dreams for pro career don't uh, 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 realize that are not realized. They can come back to school and finish their degree and have a productive uh, career in a number of fields. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's one way to look at it, and, and that would be much more honest, I think, uh, rather than not paying uh, these so-called student athletes while the assistant coaches are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, I think one of the assistants. A couple of years ago, got the first million dollar contract for an assistant coach on the football team. Assistant coach. <laughs> this is where we are, so it's, 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 uh, it's just astounding. Um, you made uh, um, so many points, uh, I don't know uh, where else to go, except to say that, you know, uh, Professor Thompson, uh, Sidney McClendon, was saying that, you know, uh, that they can't perform, uh, and then it becomes like a self-fulfilling 
prophecy, they, they do less well in their academic performance. Uh, so in terms of grade point average, one of the things that we can do is help them in emphasizing the student side of their, of their identity. So they have an athletic identity, but they have an academic identity, a student identity as well. Just emphasizing that, that side uh, can be helpful uh, to them in terms of uh, student athlete rather than the athlete student. I'd, I'd like to add a little bit more other feature that, that sports suffers from. And sports is an extremely visible part of the world we live in. And I've challenged students once in a while, or especially in those that are in their older years, to go back to their high school class from big school, small schools, and say to me, how many of the athletes in how many people, students, in your class went on to play college sports? And many of them will say, Mary, George, Tom, Bill, Gary, Bob. Why? Because they're visible. They're seen. They're on the field. They're, they're the media. The papers would like to like talk about the local team, the local concept. Uh, many times, the sporting events in the local communities are places for families and kids to actually get together. They may not, you know, families may come together to watch the game, but it may be the only time they get to interact with other families. So there's, a, there's this idea that this area is visible. And then I challenge them and say, okay, now that you've mentioned those six or eight people that you, out of your class that went on to participate in college athletics, how many of them were scholarship winners? Most of them will go, I think Mary got one. Well, I think Bob might have gotten one. But is it their fault? Or is it the fact that the society around them looks and says, the scholarship winners get one little paragraph once after the award, and that's the end. Where Mary, the volleyball player, was very good is a visible part of the community. She walks down the street, and every kid and every parent will pat her on the back and say, great game, nice, I'm well, welcome, I'm going to talk to you. So there's this whole kind of mystique around athletics that makes it extremely visible to us. And I, we have 800 and some athletes on this campus. Five of them, out of any one particular year, might actually go on and make a career out of money from sports on a regular basis. The rest of them go into every other academic institution. They go into faculty positions. They go into leadership positions. They go out and raise families. They go out and conduct community life. They raise their children. All of those things are still going on. And yet, many of the discussions that I hear on, on in, like the one you mentioned, they generalize the sport, but they're really talking about a community or a situation. And they, the generalization, that, and I agree with that, the generalization that student athletes are not, they should be athlete students, it doesn't really, doesn't really go. Because I've been around athletes for 45 years, and 95% of them are the highest quality people on campus. How often does our counseling center actually go to someone and say, you're not having, you're having a problem, let me help you. In athletics, it does it all the time. How many of the, the of our campus leaders are actually asked generally and are, are encouraged to participate in community activities? That's an NCAA regulation. They're supposed to be participating in community benefits. So where, where do we draw the line as to what is good and what is not good, and where does it come from, and why did it create it in the first place? Um, risk is a thing, you know, some sports of jeopardy are saying will be in jeopardy for the next 20 years because of injury problems. And so the question you want to ask yourself is, and I'm not arguing for or against this, but if, if football were to go away, let's take an extreme example, football were to go away, given what you know about our society and our desire for this passion of competitive events, what would you put in, and I'll use our own example, what would you put in Spartan Stadium 
on Saturday afternoon for four hours that would generate as much income, not only for the athletics department, but those people who are putting in their time to make money for their organizations by running concession stands, all of the people who are employed to maintain that standard, all of the people who maintain the facility, all of those things are employed people now. And what would happen if that stadium didn't exist to all those jobs? And that's a small sample, but take a look at any large sample. So the economic impact of that level of sports can be well beyond the local picture and really look at a national scene. I had a student once tell me, I said, and I was at Penn State at the time, I said, if they got rid of football, well, what sport would take over Beaver Stadium? Which at that time was about 80,000, now it's 100 plus thousand. What sport would they, you know what their philosophy was? Ultimate Frisbee. And I said, okay, that, I mean, you know what Ultimate Frisbee is, some of you play, they throw the Frisbee around. And they would say it would take over. And I said, probably it would take over, but in order for it to draw the same crowds, not because of the nature of the game, but because of the nature of the people who go to these games, if I put a helmet on them, put shoulder pads on them, and let them run into each other. But now, instead of throwing a football around, you're throwing a Frisbee around, when you it would become Frisbee. But it would look a lot like what we have now. It's not necessarily because the game is good, bad, or indifferent. It's what the people who pay to see it, or to watch it, or to write about it, or who promote it on whatever levels, from little league, look at the little little leagues, little league players have more publicity than scholarship people. Because that's the way things are in that community. How do we change that paradigm to where we put as much economic and as much power into our scholarship people as we do into those who are blessed with a particular position in some athletic environment? Very complicated question, but I think it's important to realize that not what you hear in the media is not always reflective of the bigger picture. Now, well, question, please raise your hand. Before we go on, huh? okay. Jack, it's now, but before we, before we get Jack, please raise your hands now so I know where you are. Okay, good. Thanks. One of the things that we point out in our book, we have white shadow, is the distinction perceptual observation and conceptual consideration. A fan is one who is engaged in perceptual observation. An athlete is engaged in what we call participatory activity. And that's important because it means that what is most apparent, the sporting event, is open to observation and participation, but not necessarily conceptual consideration. That's where philosophy comes in. It makes an analysis of the relationships that form the, the social fabric, what's going on, the social institutions, practices of institutions uh, that become a part of what we call the sports spectacle. Now, when we look very carefully at the notion of sports, it is important to point out that Division I sports is different than Division II and different than Division III. The compelling factors in terms of the political and economic compelling factors are greater in Division I than they are in Division III. However, even in sports like volleyball, I was talking with my granddaughter, Deja, who is a three-time All-American, and she said her biggest disappointment in signing a contract to play volleyball when she's won a national championship and she's been at the very pinnacle of her sport is that I have very little time to do anything that I want to do as a student because of the demands of the time of my sport and my classroom work. So virtually, if she's not doing volleyball, she's studying. If she's not studying, she's doing volleyball. And it's not a matter of a nine-month after the year, is she around? Now, the reality is that the, the problem of the social organization of sport 
amount of money except the person who works. And what do we call a system where everybody makes money and the person who works is not paid? I think we call that slavery. What we see today is that students who commit themselves to a very rigorous program of highly competitive sports, it doesn't mean that they can't be successful academically, but at what cost? What does she did not get to do that she wanted to do that other students could take for granted they can do? So she says, no, I just don't have time to do that. I only have time to study, to practice, and to play. And at the end of the, the journey, she'll have her degree. She won't be, you know, part of that group who failed to graduate. But she was robbed of the opportunity of the enrichment that comes from most college students. So she should be paid. It's quite simple. The NCAA has a 20-hour rule. And I listened to Rick Pitino, the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame last week, lamenting the fact that the 20-hour rule came in he used to have his guys at first be play 20 hours a day. And then they came out with the 20 hour rule that says that you can't have practices beyond 20 hours in a week. And he was lamenting that. So, you know, back in the good old days, I would actually be out on the floor and the guys in Providence and Delray Brooks and Billy uh, uh, Dunham and I would be really out there playing and we would play personally the whole day. And I said, wow, think about what he just said. I said, when you think about what he just said, the idea that this was a student was the last thing on the coach's mind. And for most coaches, that's the last thing on a coach's mind with one caveat, as long as you stay eligible to play. That's when they become concerned with how well students And this is why a lot of students don't graduate, because what happens is that coaching staffs selectively try to find courses so the students will stay eligible, not the students graduate and have a beyond their, their experience in sports. The so-called contract that the NCAA gives students, it is annual. And it's a one-way contract. In fact, it's ludicrous. It's called a contract. One of the things I'm going to talk about in my philosophy law class, for those who will be interested in taking it in the spring, is that we're going to talk about what is a contract. With the NCAA, the students do not have the right to break the contract. They have to get the okay of the institution to leave the contract. But you tell me how many coaches leave year in and year out to take better jobs and tell the students they recruited, hey, I recruited you here. I said I was going to be here, but hey, these people are paying me a lot of money. See you later. What's this guy, Nick, uh, the football coach, Nick? Uh, was it he said at one time? Yes. At Michigan State? Okay, you, you get my point. And he makes quite a bit of money. He makes more money than the president of his university. So what I'm trying to get at is then that the students are being exploited. Now whether or not that leads to the failure of a student to, to achieve the degree or not is beside the point. That's the extreme example of, of the level of oppression which then a student breaks down and can't succeed academically. Most of the people who now understand what the system is about like the Division I basketball, they uh, leave every year. So this guy over in Kentucky, he's noted for generating, you know, draft choices after a year in Kentucky. They go a year and leave go into the NBA. Because what sense does it make when everybody else is making a lot of money and your family is hungry and the NCAA says that no matter what, you cannot receive anything from anyone in order for your basic survival, and we know that a lot of the athletes who are supreme athletes, like in basketball and football, come from poor families. They don't have basic means, but yet they're not allowed to even give basic support. That's real. That's what we call the materialist conception of history, where the social relations of production govern how people live. It is not the ideas and consciousness of the people that determine their social conditions but better yet, the social conditions that determine their consciousness. When we transform those institutions, and what I argue, the way we can go to student athletes is that they should organize into unions, just as graduate students have done. They should begin then to make a demand for pay, and that the whole structure needs to be attacked. I agree that it's a part of the way in which business is run. But the way business is run is based upon a model of exploitation. We can't overlook that fact. Okay, we have a question right here. Oh, sure. Thank you.
Um, I see kind of the two sides of the panel here. One side that's uh, a little more personal and physiological, and one that's more philosophical and uh, sociological. Um, so I kind of address the panel from here um, up to there. And I'm interested in um, the correlation of sports and violence, and perhaps that's presumptive, but uh, uh, it's something that I got to see as a kid. You know, I would go to Lions games, and the, all the people around me, uh, drunk and belligerent, or whatever it may be, and we see a lot of instances um, in the media of um, the participants in those sports and violence. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't tell if it's something that's American, if violence is sort of something that just goes along with sports, if it's inherent, um, it seems to go along a lot stronger with things like hockey and football, but tennis, uh, not so much. Um, so I'm interested in your perspectives um, on sports and violence um, from the personal and physiological level or, psych or um, the psychology, and also the effects um, that sports has on the populace at large um, on a more uh, philosophical and sociological level. Well, from the, the personal uh, level, uh, we oftentimes uh, use the social learning uh, theory and uh, social learning uh, progression. Uh, so uh, if, it is, uh, if it's modeled uh, and if it's rewarded, uh, then you're going to, to see more of it. Some of the research that we've done at the youth sport level has found uh, a higher correlation between uh, Young, young athletes who play for a, a more experienced coach. Um, the, the more experienced the coach and the more the coach believes he or she uh, really uh, is good and has a lot of confidence in the game strategy, uh, the more they would indicate that they are intent to commit uh, an act of aggression in order to have an advantage. That, that is it. As part of the game, kind of becomes institutionalized as, as a part of the game, a, a tripping in, uh, in, in soccer uh, to uh, uh, keep uh, a breakaway to the, to the goal from happening. Uh, but there's also, there's also um, um, some work that has shown that uh, if, if uh, athletes um, are, are, are taught sense of what we call bracketed morality uh, that can be sort of these are things you can do on, on the field you can't you can't do them on the street uh, and uh, it just because you know they do it on the field doesn't mean that they're a more aggressive person um, on the street it doesn't mean that they um, there's more domestic violence in the, in the home it doesn't necessarily transfer but a lot of it goes back to what we found is the and delusion, um, and what comes is tolerate, don't tolerate. That's the that from the individual level. I, I would want to answer your question, but I want to ask you a question first. Sure. What's your definition of violence? Uh, I, I mean, it's fairly broad. I just think the word. It could be, it, it could be as simple as, as aggression. But I know you talked a lot about um, risk management and injury, and that's well, something you know, that happens all the time in sports. And Something like football is—it's a pretty aggressive sport. It has to be because that translates to violence. That kind of the, the, the question becomes: the reason I ask is because violence is a term that is extremely valued. My impression of violence can be completely different than your impression of violence. Yeah. So, in order for us to really have an eloquent conversation, we sort of have to have a parameter for that. So, if you're talking about aggressive behavior, um, yes. It happens in certain kinds of sports. It happens in everywhere. It may just not be as obvious as it is in more collision-oriented activities like hockey and football. But there are young people in all aspects of it who are very aggressive volleyball players or track athletes. I don't know what cross-country meet out here the other day where they had 6,200 cross-country runners from all over the state, high school, college, all nine yards. There was a lot of very dedicated people out there running these distances uh, and, and putting they're literally all into it. Um, now that would associate cross country with the concept of violence. But by 
the same token, the nature of the game is what creates the risk, the rules, the regulations, the way in which the people behave. And you know, we can study the sport respect from its environment. We can look at stadiums and surfaces and equipment and rules and regulations and referees and coaches, and we can have all that. It's another whole issue to be able to see what kind of risk factors the individual brings with them to the field. And that's when you get into things like aggression uh, or assertiveness. Well, many would prefer to call it assertiveness rather than aggressive because their definition of aggressive is far different than assertion. Sure. So it's, it's what do they bring with them? Their, their background, their cultural background, their educational background, their family background. Um, one of my students related a story today of an individual in a, in, a, in a high school setting who had a torn ACL injury from an athletic event, I don't know what the event was, and the father refused to allow the kid to go to see the doctor and said, get back and play. So where does that kind of thing bring with you when you come to participate in what would be so studying and trying to figure out what is the best type of internal risk factor model to bring to a field of competition, as well as our responsibility to provide a field of competition that is reasonably free of foreseeable problems. It's a balance. And it's a decision-making balance, and it's a practical balance. We can argue about the philosophical considerations of it, but in reality, it's a practical decision-making model, both for the player and for the organizer and the participant. As we continue this question, when you first started, I, I heard another take on it in terms of the fans. And so clearly there's the athletes, but there's also the violence of the fans. I mean, you can think about soccer or rugby around the world. So as we continue, I'd ask if the panelists would also take that perspective into consideration. Yeah. Well, I would too.
these are fans who feel entitled by virtue of being fans that somehow they own the Athens. And this goes back to the whole slave mentality that we talked about before, is that somehow white fans in particular think they have ownership over the black athlete. And so therefore that mentality is reflected in a lot of things from abusive comments uh, towards athletes and not expecting an athlete to respond. So when you talk about that kind of balance, whether it be a physical contact or verbal insult or assault, is something that, that plays as a real part of sports today and, and something that is talked about very little. In fact, generally the talk is always when the, the athletes become incensed by that kind of insult and they retaliate and then it makes the news and say, oh, the athletes went out to the stands after people and this is what these black athletes are doing. And so David Stern in the NBA comes up with a whole bunch of rules to make black athletes more acceptable to a white fan base. So he comes up with a dress code that goes against something called hip hop attire. And uh, he begins to select certain people who are pushed out of the league because they don't fit this kind of image of what a black athlete is like. When we talk about one athlete who was a Muslim who had refused to to stand for the national anthem and therefore was forced out of the NBA. Today he plays in Japan. And what was interesting about it is that his home was actually burned down in Mississippi because of his position on standing for the flag of the national anthem. So we talk about fan violence. It's just very real for a lot of Sorry, can I uh, respond quickly? And you think that comes from the mostly uh, sort of that ownership aspect that you talked about? That it's carried over so far that even today we, we think that we have ownership over, over black athletes. If you look at the recent issue with LeBron James leaving Cleveland along the Miami, yeah. <clears throat> almost universally the fans were upset and they were most biased. Insults and assaults for white fans. A lot of people who lived in Cleveland and lived in Akron understood. And while they were Cleveland Cavaliers fans, they understood what LeBron James and the were doing in his lane and they applauded that. I talked with Oscar Robertson, who was the person responsible for free agency in the NBA, and I asked him his, his view on the LeBron James you know, situation. And what he said to me was, that's what we fought for. He's known what any other worker would do. If you want to work somewhere and I decide to leave Michigan State and go down the road to Ann Arbor, I have that right. <laughs> <laughs> any worker has that right. That, that's what Karl Marx talks about, being free labor, free in the sense of being free for the means of production and then free to choose where you work. That's, that's just basic to the way which our society operates. But with the racist dimension to that, there's this notion that, that somehow LeBron James does not have the right to choose where he wants to play basketball, and so therefore people see that they have the right then to, to make death threats. So they were making death threats. So it, it's not, it's that kind of violence, fan violence, that, that, that I think is very significant and we many times we ignore. I would ask you, fan violence of Society or is it the responsibility is it because the sports people? Which is kind of what I was going to jump in on, right? The tragic event of, uh, of today in the DC Navy are pretty clearly illustrated that we live in a violent society, as Professor McClendon has been pointing out and in others as well. It would be surprising if our sport didn't reflect that. But, but, but I would also uh, add something else, and that is that. I would argue that sport is not just a mirror of society, but actually at times constitutes what we see in society. Here's a silly little example, of, uh, I think an, an extraordinary revealing one. Uh, ESPN has this silly uh, awards show, festival, gala, whatever you want to call it, called the ESPYs. Okay, I don't follow that, but I sometimes keep tabs on who is what and why. There's lots of interesting Anyway, the play of the year in the NFL that won the ESPY was a defensive tackle 
that almost decapitated the opposing player. I mean, it was the most incredibly violent physical act I think I had ever witnessed on, on a sports card. That's what won the SP. And what I'm getting at here is that there's a whole industry side, a supply side, you know, driving force that glorifies violence and that sells violence that encourages violence. And we're all people and we all respond to these stimuli in different ways. But that's what gets the prize at the end of the year. Now this is football, it's an incredibly tough game. Um, but I just wanted to put that out, that, that you know, it's not just individuals making random choices or, or voluntary actions uh, alone. There are these structures of force that are playing into it. And whether it's, you know, what we witnessed uh, today in DC, or whether it's ESPN glorifying this kind of brutality, we should keep that in mind. Um, now, yeah. I I've got one last question back here, but let me invite everybody before I give the mic to him. It's like the National Press Club where he gets the last question. Um, if you have questions afterward, do rush the, rush the panel, you know, looking like something on pro sports, uh, to be able to get your questions in because I'm sure that they'll uh, answer them for you. But here's our last question. Uh, Dr. McLeod, did you bring up that uh, sports, uh, when one back person benefits wholly from another is slavery? Adrian Peterson, two years ago, called the NFL modern day slavery um, in relation to the organization and the player's salary and the discrepancy um, of wages. We see major sports organizations, FIFA, NCAA, making tremendous amounts of profit, and they give people certain opportunities, the rags to riches story that we hear a lot of, Andrew McCutcheon and other players, that are able to rise up, yet other players aren't able to see those benefits. Do you think that the sports world would benefit if they took the business aspect out of it and made it just a purely sport thing? Or if they just kept profiting and making money off and allowing people to make jobs and living off the sport? That's a good question. <clears throat> and this is why when we talk about mirror, we actually mean it is part and parcel of the, the broader social factor. This is not something we don't hold to a principle of sports exceptionalism. A number of people do. Uh, there's something called virtue ethics approach to sports which says that with sports you can teach character and develop a kind of view of yourself that sports introduces. And so a number of educators argue that there is this virtue ethics character to sports, that you become a better person, there's no team and I, you do not cooperate, and all the rest of those things. So this gives sports this kind of pure kind of ideal in which we can reach for something better. The reality is that, I think, is that when we begin to look at the question of the reality of the social, political, economic structures that institutionalize the process, then we begin to understand it's not removed from that. All right? So what that means, in effect, is that it's not enough to talk about an ideal over and over again against the realities that we face. Rather, how do we transform those realities so that we have a more progressive, a better developed society? So it's a struggle, an internal contradiction, I would call it, that goes on as we try to change those institutions. So there is this commodity aspect of sports, and we understand it as a commodity aspect. So the question is, how do, how do workers better organize themselves to have better work conditions, right? The same would apply then for athletes as workers. So what we say is that, for example, if you look at the average lifespan of an NBA basketball player, which is 2.5 years, most people last no more than two and a half years in the NBA. So you can't really make a lot of money in two and a half years. I know many former NBA players who returned to my hometown, and it's kind of like they went into a spiral of depression because they were great players, but there were only so many spots, and for whatever reason, many times political and not athletic, they were out of the sport, and then they had to return home. 
but there was the expectation of friends and family that they were going to also benefit from that one individual who was going to you know, give money and all the rest of that, and they didn't have it to give, or they gave it all and then they were broke. What we have to understand is that this reality, the reality of what we call bourgeois society, capitalist society, means that those of us who are being exploited and oppressed have to fight and transform the conditions in which we face. This is why we think the notions like collective bargaining, the ending of the reserve clause, which Oscar Robertson fought for, the, the current Edo Manning suit against the NCAA, uh, which says that athletes will not be held in perpetuity to use their images and their likeness. They make millions of dollars. Edo Banning has been out of sports for a number of years, and still today they use his image on these uh, video sports games and they sell his jerseys and people raise millions of dollars while he's just trying to make ends meet. And he says, why can't I use my own image? I mean, how do you have a situation whereby? So these are the fights that, that we have to begin to think in terms of. We have to be able to understand this. And one of the things we talk about, when we talk about these very things in the book that you raised today, one of the things we talk about is that the notion of class is not based upon Income. In fact, that's going to be part of our discussion in our class tomorrow. The, 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 the source of wealth is not a matter of income. It's a matter of one's relationship to the means of production. So you may be a highly paid athlete, but that does not mean that you're not a part of the working class. If we examine very carefully percentage of athletes who make big, big money, you'll see that they are a small percent of the average professional athlete. The average professional athlete will be in and out of the league before you finish your four years of college education in Michigan State or five years in Michigan State. I saw the young man who was a very good basketball player here at Michigan State last summer at the NBA Summer League. And I came over to him and said, my wife and daughter are a big fan of yours. Wish you the best. But one thing I knew about this young man, and I'm, I'm only seen him on a few occasions, is that I think he understood how the system was working. And I don't think he'll be caught up in it. What's his name? Uh, Green. Yes, yes. You, you, may, you may know him. An exceptional young person who's not just a great athlete, but a great young man. Now, if he understands the logic of the system, then he will work towards his own end and not let the system work him. This is what I think is very important for us to understand. Many times we say, well, he's an athlete or she's an athlete, they make all this money, so therefore, what are they complaining about? Well, the fact of the matter is that the rag the richest story, as, as we see in the various aspects of this society, only happened to a few. That's why we have more people in poverty today than we had 20 years ago. People do not choose to be impoverished. No one chooses to be impoverished. No one chooses to be poor. No one chooses to be hungry. No one chooses to be homeless. That's not a choice. That's an objective condition. And we call those objective conditions, they're rooted in the very class position that people hold in this society. Everyone would like to have a lot of money, or at least live decently. But the fact remains is that in this society, it is a stratified society in which the rich get richer, the poor get poor. John, I'm going to use that point to, to transition us to our next forum because I, I think that that's a, an excellent segue. We hope that you will join us and or tell others about the October 21st forum, Detroit, the past, present, and future of the city, where some of the topics that were raised today will certainly be pertinent. And, and I'm going to use the moderators on prerogative to ask the final question because I actually want to hear more about the astronauts. So then if you can kind of give us a two to three minute, you know, spill about a little bit more on the astronauts. Um, okay. The the um, the astronauts, uh, first of all, they're the mean age of an experienced astronaut is 48 years. They're, they're not 20-somethings you know, or even uh, uh, early 30-somethings that, that uh, you might uh, think of. Uh, so uh, they, um, uh, they, they're going to have, uh, like anybody in aging, is, is going to have uh, a longer period of time uh, to, uh, to recover from a long space flight. Uh, and, uh, and 
case, their bone density, uh, muscle mass, and cardiovascular function. And um, there's a, an exercise physiologist, in fact, two of them who are, are working with us. One has, has designed a program, which is a pretty rigorous exercise program for them, six days a week. That's something that they have to fit in. Uh, in uh, a short space of time. So they have to get in, they have to be very efficient, they have to uh, work at a fairly high intensity in order to have this, you know, this benefit. But when you're having to do that, it's as you probably all know as well, that the harder you have to work at something, um, the harder it is to stay motivated uh, to do it. There's some fatigue that sets in, uh, some discomfort, some, some pain, uh, not injury pain, but you know, just uncomfortable kind of, kind of pain. So if there's a if there's a, something that's somewhat entertaining for them, some way of making it enjoyable, uh, then that will help. And so what we've what we've done is design uh, something can be embedded into what we call an extra game, an exercise video game uh, that um, uh, they can they can exercise with a virtual partner. Uh, a partner they know isn't real, just like any kind of video game that you might have. Characters aren't real. But um, uh, we are betting on the fact that they will develop a relationship with this uh, not real uh, partner. Somewhat like, you know, you might have, um, if you have a GPS system in your car, you might have named her. Uh, <laughs> or you know, they even have some funny commercials about some of that. Uh, that, that that we, that we tend to develop uh, relationships with things that are uh, artificial uh, if they interact with us in a human way. It's, it's something that uh, is an evolutionary kind of component of, of humans. So that's, that's basically what this is about. We won't be able to ex actually use astronauts. There aren't enough of them. So we have to use some uh, we have to use participants who are comparable, uh, fairly physically fit, middle-aged, Adults. So if you think you might fit that uh, category, uh, see me, we'll try to sign you up. Great, thanks Deb. I want to ask if you would acknowledge the participation of all of our panelists. They were actually very great to allow me to bring them in on time to make sure we had time for conversation and, and also to give yourselves a round of applause for the dialogue and the conversation.